Just a matter of weeks after electing a new leader, the Scottish National Party is facing a major crisis. Senior figures have been questioned by police over allegations related to the party's finances. Among them is the husband of former leader Nicola Sturgeon. So just how bad are things for the SNP? Welcome to Roundtable, I'm Philip Hampshire. Scotland's new First Minister, Hamza Youssef, has admitted the scandal surrounding the SNP party is clearly very serious. Police are investigating allegations that hundreds of thousands of pounds raised between 2017 and 2020 to fight for a new independence referendum are unaccounted for. Former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon's resignation in February came as something of a shock. Since then, her husband has been questioned by police, along with the SNP's long-serving treasurer. Some have speculated she could be next. There are suggestions her successor, Yusuf, may struggle to survive politically now. So how bad is this for the SNP? So let's meet our guests. I'm joined in the studio by Chris Banbury, who's author of The People's History of Scotland and Scotland, Class and Nation. Joined uh, by Sir John Curtis, who's a political scientist and polling expert at the University of Strathclyde as well. And also we have Ian Lawson, who's a former national executive for the SNP and chair of the Scottish National Congress Steering Committee. So, Chris, I'm going to start with you, if I may. Simple uh, question, this first one. How serious is this problem for the SNP? I think it is serious. I think it was signs that it was coming. Uh, to have the widow of the party married to the chief executive was not particularly intelligent. Uh, it was a problem pointed out. There was also the resignation of the treasurer prior to Colin Beattie, Douglas Chapman, who was denied access to the accounts of the party, having been elected treasurer. I think the real problem for the party is as well is that under Nicola Sturgeon in particular, it became a very centralised party, very successful electorally, but the price of that was great centralisation. The party conference increasingly became a rally, very little debate, very little motions. And while I think they kept a lid on uh, any dissent inside of that, this is a moment that's been waiting to happen. And I think it's going to be difficult. And I feel sorry, sorry for Hamza Youssef being put placed in this job, but he is the continuity candidate in the sense that he was the chosen uh, successor by Nicola Sturgeon. That is no longer really viable. Uh, and I think there has to be a change in part of the internal culture, which became quite toxic over a whole range of issues, including this gender legis uh, legislation. Uh, I think the diff a lot of things have come home to roost, which were obvious in the build-up, and it's going to be damaging. There's no question about that. Right, well, we'll come back to Hamza Yusuf in a minute, because obviously I'm going to have to ask you how secure his job is. But first, Ian, let me take it across to you. Um, how serious do you think the situation is for the SNP? Well, I wouldn't disagree with anything that's been said previously. I think uh, it's pretty much on the money. I think the problem, however, is much deeper than that because uh, I agree great change is required. But the problem is the internal changes that have made, been made during uh, Nicola Sturgeon's time, largely by Angus Robertson, uh, are very, very difficult to overturn. Uh, they require you know, the party going back to conference, putting in that completely different resolution, looking for a fully elected national executive council, the return of a national council. Now, these are going to require a two-thirds majority. So, you know, it's going to be very, very difficult, I think, even for the folk that recognise the need for great change and quickly to be able to achieve that. The other worrying thing I would say is there's no obvious sign as yet of any of the more prominent members of the party being willing to front that up. And that, that just makes it an absolutely hopeless situation all round. I mean, the problems are not just the money. The money's definitely a problem. But there's many, many other problems that have been disguised and hidden. And, you know, the, the party became almost Stalinist in terms of control under Nicola Sturgeon. So it's very, very difficult unless some leadership emerges to make the changes that are required, and I just don't see it. Right, well, we'll talk more about that in a second too. So, John Curtis, um, 
What do you make of the situation? Is it serious for the SNP? Is it being reflected in their numbers uh, in the polls? Well, I'll come to the last bit of your question in a moment. The, uh, there are some obvious risks that the SNP currently face. I think essentially there are three. Number one is that they are now led by somebody who is not particularly popular and whose performance in the leadership election was, to say the least, relatively disappointing, given that he had the overwhelming support you know, so far as the public declarations of parliamentarians in London and Edinburgh is concerned. Um, SNP members, much like SNP voters, were in the end pretty much evenly divided between Mr Yusuf and Ms Forbes. So that means they've got a leader whose authority over the party is less than is desirable, number one. Number two, uh, whatever ends up happening so far as the allegations around the SNP and its finances are concerned, the pictures uh, a fortnight ago of the police outside Peter Merrill and Nicholas Sturgeon's homes and indeed outside the party headquarters, uh, police vans, tents, uh, these were terrible, terrible pictures that will be constantly repeated. And all this has happened at a time when, and this is the third risk, that the Labour Party had, was already enjoying a something of a revival north of the border, not because of anything that had Labour Party had particularly done north of the border, or indeed because, at least until hitherto, that the SNP were in any particular trouble. It was rather that, like the Labour Party across the UK as a whole, the party in Scotland was profiting from Partygate and the fallout from the Liz Trust administration. But it did therefore mean that by the time we got to Nicola Sturgeon's resignation, the Labour Party was already at um, in the high 20s in the opinion polls. Now, what impact has all this had? Well, certainly the election of Humza Yusuf, we know from published Scottish polling, uh, uh, support for the party ended up being three points down in the polls conducted immediately after his election, as compared with where the party was immediately after Nicola Sturgeon's resignation. And that the party's lead over Labour had basically halved from around 13, 14 points to down about seven. Now, we've had as yet no published polls, Scotland only polls, of voting intentions since the arrest of Peter Murrell. I have, however, had a look at the innards of the British polls, which, you know, this has to be done with a great deal of caveats. But if you look at the figures for voting intention uh, in Scotland in those British polls and you know, aggregate them together, looks as though there might be another two or three percent swing against the SNP uh, since the uh, since those uh, most recent uh, Scotland only polls. Now, if that's roughly right as to what the short term damage is, then we now may be in a situation where SNP and Labour are roughly equal with each other in terms of Westminster voting tensions, that would certainly be enough to give the Labour Party something like the 20 seats at Westminster from Scotland that it's trying to achieve. But equally, it's not meltdown. We are not talking about some sudden catastrophic collapse in SNP support, as opposed to a further easing of a situation that, that was already uh, less strong than it once was. Well, Chris, let me take this back to you because you mentioned the position of Hamza Youssef. He's just come in as leader of the SNP. He had a very bruising fight with uh, a three-way contest for the most part there. Um, as he's come in, you mentioned he's the continuity candidate and he has mostly stood by each of the various different people uh, who so far been taken in by the police for questioning. Two of them, of course, have been arrested and then uh, later released while the investigation continues. Now, his, he's sitting there saying these people are innocent until they're proven guilty. That is, of course, entirely true for the general population. In politics, though, Things matter. He is coming under pressure. I mean, Ash Regan, the third candidate in the election, is already saying that these people should be removed from membership. Uh, I think it's becoming very difficult for Hamza. I, I feel slightly sorry for him. He looks as if he's aged a great deal in just a few a, a few a few weeks. But he is the continuity candidate. He was Nicholas Sturgeon's chosen successor. There are, however, many believe that some of the more heavyweight candidates who chose not to stand. Angus Robertson, who's been mentioned being one, did so because they've been aware that something was going to happen, that Nicola Sturgeon had resigned because of bad odour. 
Now, we didn't know the extent of this, but there was already lots of rumours flying, uh, flying about. And therefore, lots of people are suggesting that Hamza has been put in there as the fall guy, and later on, other heavyweight candidates will come in. We'll see. Uh, I think the SNP aren't in meltdown, and I think the reason for that as well is that Labour and the Conservatives are, at the moment, competing for a unionist vote, so they're not expanding that vote. Uh, that could change, but there again, you know, so Keir Starmer's uh, lead is narrowing in England as well, so that dynamic might impact on the events in Scotland. The question, I think, really is, can the SNP make a change? And as Ian has suggested, it's not easy to do that, but I think there has to be change. There has to be an end to the toxic internal culture, there has to be a democratisation of the party, and there has to be a break with the politics of Nicola Sturgeon, the, I haven't got time to talk about this, the Growth Commission and much else. We'll talk about the democratisation of them in a second, but do you think Hamza Yosef can survive this? I think it's going to be difficult for him. Uh, I think he's not been at the top of his game, and particularly after the arrest of Col uh, Colin Beatty. Uh, as I say, I think the, the, the clock is ticking really for Hamza. Ian, do you think that uh, Hamza Yosef can survive this? Well, you know, unless he starts doing things rather than just playing being the continuity candidate, I've got to say I hope he doesn't survive because they need a leader that's going to take action. And they don't have unlimited time. John's right. You know, other parties will make progress by default unless the SNP get their act together. I'm not really worried about the long-term effect uh, for two reasons. Firstly, the polling shows that there's a separation now happening between support for independence and support for the SNP. While the SNP vote may well be going down, support uh, for independence stays constant. And I think that points the finger at why there'll be no great Labour revival. Re Labour are against independence, quite hostile, at least as hostile as the Conservatives. So it's very difficult to see a large numbers of voters who broadly support independence making a transition across to Labour, I think much more likely, uh, is if the SNP don't get their act together, voter independence voters will stay at home, as they did in 2017, rather than move across to Labour. So I think, you know, it's wrong to think there'll be a great re revival for Labour, uh, I, I think, in Scotland. But I would like to see action on the SNP side, not platitudes. And what we're getting is platitudes and diversion from Himza, and that's not going to cure the problems. Well, this leader of the Scottish Labour Party was practically salivating as, the, uh, as this scandal unfolded in front of them. Um, here's uh, a clip from Anas Sawar uh, in which uh, they had to say this. But what Hamza Yusuf can't escape from is that he is not now running a functioning government. Yeah. This is an SNP that is mired in scandal, yeah. mired in division, talking to themselves about themselves. And the crisis that now engulfs the SNP is not just an indication of how they govern their party, but also how they govern our country. Sir John, what are we to uh, make of this in terms of the chances that it might lead for other political parties in Scotland, like the Scottish Labour Party? Well, um, the Scottish Labour Party is the one party on the unionist side that is capable of profiting directly from any loosening of SNP support. And there are signs that some of that's been going on uh, already. Uh, the truth is that the support for the Conservatives is indeed virtually wholly confined to those who want to, uh, Scotland to stay inside the Union. Most of Labour's support comes from the same quarter, but Labour does have some ability to secure the support of some people who vote yes. So the truth is that, at least until recently, the overwhelming majority of people who were in favour of independence were voting for the SNP. That figure was around 88% in the Holyrood election of 2021. But that remaining 12%, it was the Labour Party to, to which primarily it was inclined to go. And if you look at what's happened with the decline in SNP support uh, since uh, Nicola Sturgeon's resignation, that three-point drop across the public as whole is referring to, well, that's now associated with only around 70% of current supporters of independents saying they'd vote for the SNP. Where are the rest going? Well, nearly 20% are 
are actually going to Labour Party. So the Labour Party has had some success in expanding uh, its ability to persuade those who are still in favour of independence to vote for it. And that on the back of what the party had already achieved uh, uh, during the previous 12, 18 months, which was to uh, advance um, strongly amongst no voters, uh, at the expense of the Conservatives because of developments at Westminster. It's that a sequence of events that's left Mr Sawa in the, with the prospect of perhaps the Labour Party being able to get significant number of seats in uh, Scotland for the first time uh, since 2010. And, you know, this matters both to British and to Scottish politics. It matters to British politics because if indeed Labour can pick up 20 seats in Scotland, that could knock as much as four points off the lead that Labour would require over the Conservatives across the UK as a whole in order to get an overall majority. And secondly, of course, it reduces the chances of there being a hung parliament in which the SNP uh, have leverage. And in my, my view has long been that the only way we're likely to get a referendum on independence sooner rather than later is if we did add, end up with a hung parliament in which the SNP potentially had leverage, not necessarily immediately after uh, such an outcome, but during the course of the ensuing years um, when perhaps the, the minority Labour administration was at risk of losing a vote of no confidence and would need the support of the SNP to survive. Sort of similar to the Liberal Democrats managing, managing to get a referendum on trying to change the electoral system. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 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 absolutely. Or indeed, you know, if you go back to the 1974 to 1979 Parliament, when did Labour find itself forced to do a deal with the then Liberal Party in order to stop it, itself from losing a vote of no confidence in 1976, when it undoubtedly would have lost the election, when it did a deal with the then Liberal Party, not arguably on relatively favourable terms. The point is that we know now that any deals that Labour might have to strike with the SNP in such circumstances would not necessarily be quite so favourable to Labour. Ian, do you agree with that? Well, I think it's a fairly depressing message for anyone in Scotland who believes in independence. If Sir John believes the only way we're likely to ever get a decision is if we rely on English votes to vote narrowly enough to give us a hung parliament. It's a pretty depressing message. And I suspect that most Scots don't want to go through that. Most of us have lived, uh, certainly I have, since 19, born in 1952. And uh, there's been one Tory victory in Scotland since then, uh, all these years. And I mean, that came when I was three in 1955. But we've been suffering in Scotland, living under a Tory government we never voted for. And, you know, that cannot go on indefinitely, even though it appears to be going on at the moment. As I say, I think in a true election where there's a competent SNP leader arguing the case for independence up front, that 20% that John's talking about of Labour voter, yes, voters, I think a lot of them would switch to the SNP very quickly in that circumstance and you could see Labour maybe losing even the one seat they have in Scotland. Now, that doesn't seem likely now, and there's going to be an election fairly shortly. But all that tells me is the urgency in terms of the SNP getting their act together, getting a decent leader and getting back on message. Chris, we've mentioned the Scottish Conservatives. Um, Throughout most of my lifetime, I think, or certainly throughout most of the 1980s and 90s, there have been more panda bears in the UK than there have been Scottish Conservative MPs. So if, if the Scottish Conservatives can't really get their act together and get something out of this, what's the point of them? Do you think they can get something out of no, this? No, I don't think they can. I think there is a limit to the unionist vote. And I think they, they got there very quickly. The 2017 general election, they almost reached a peak there. I think it's very difficult to advance. I think it undermines another issue, however, which is the fact that there are continually conservative governments which still have considerable power in Scotland, which Scots don't elect, undermines what's driving the support for independence, which is a crisis in the UK and a crisis in the British political system, the decline of the, the UK, which has been all my life, never been addressed, the alliance with the United States, all these different issues. And if you look back, the two leap forwards in support for independence, one was devolution as a a shield against Thatcherism. But secondly, it was a move to independence under Blair, Tony Blair, our new Labour government. 
I think John's scenario is quite interesting. What happens if Sir Keir Starmer forms a government at Westminster which repeats much of the policies of Tony Blair? I think that could also lead to significant sections, particularly of the Scottish working class who might be looking for advance under uh, Starmer to then think, no, actually we're better looking towards independence. So the issues aren't just whether the SNP support, it's about a wider issue of what's been driving this shift in our lifetimes towards a, a near majority supporting Scottish independence. That's a huge change, by the way. You know, for much of that time, the SNP was a tiny percentage a very small party, and that's been one of the difficulties. The move from a small activist party to a mass party, uh, which I think was badly handled, and has led to a loss of members as well. Well, let's talk about that for the moment, because this gets to the heart of the problem. Um, the SNP looks very incestuous, for want of a better word. It looks very nepotistic. We had the leader of the SNP, we had her husband as the treasurer of the SNP. That just doesn't look good in anyone's books. You start running through the leadership, they've been pretty static or most of the same names up at the top for around a decade, perhaps even longer. How do you democratise this party? How do you root out any corruption? Whether there is or there isn't, and the police investigation is still underway, perception is going to be a problem. This is politics. Well, I think, you know, if I was a, the chair of a board of, gov a board of governors on a company and I appointed my partner as CEO, someone would come along and say, you can't do that. I mean, it's just, I, I've never heard of it in any other organisation. And this has gone on for I mean, a decade. You know, this is something which was not really acceptable. So I think it's going to be difficult to make the change. But if you go back to the leadership election, and it'd be interesting to know how that would re happen now if it was rerun, Kate Forbes came very near to winning it. It was a very close election. As John previously mentioned, Nicola Sturgeon had you know, anointed Hamza Youssef as the candidate, and yet there was a debate. First time in a long time, some of the issues came up, and I thought Ash Regan as well was putting forward a, a different perspective on how strategies for other strategies for independence. I think we need more of that. You know, one of the things that I loved about the 2014 referendum, independence referendum, was that carnival of debate and discussion which swept Scotland and really involved people. And one of the things the Sturgeon leadership did, having recruited massively from that, it then put a lid on that. You know, and they had this tightly controlled party. That has to change. We've got to go back to 2014 and that spirit of debate, discussion, which swept Scotland. It's been spectacularly. We're running out of time, so Ian, let me uh, bring you in and say, Ian, how would you democratise the party? Indeed, is democratisation the solution here? Well, it definitely needs to be democratic change. I would agree with everything that was said there. Uh, I think he's buying on the money. Uh, I, I mean, you talk about the problem with husband and wife team. It's much further than that. If you look at the Prime Minister's uh, special advisers, th th two-thirds of them are either friends or partners of other senior members of the SNP. This is a club, a pals club. And if you look at the Cabinet, you know, it's stacked full of failures. People that have been, including Humza, by the way, who was a disaster at transport, Rubbish at justice. He's not doing. He wasn't doing particularly well at health, and now he's first minister. But you've got others like Shirley Ann Somerville and others that have got catalogue of failure behind them, and they're there because they were Nicola's pals. Now Nicola's gone, and they need to go too. And we need the best of the people based on talent, not on who they're friends with. People with ideas, with ability. That's what. Hold the on, because we're, we're slowly running Scotland out of time. Wants. Let me bring Sir John in. Sir John, do you agree with all that as well? I'm not sure in the end that democratising the SNP is the essential ta uh, task that fa faces the party or is going to get it out of trouble. I think we should also remember that Mr Murrell was chief executive of the SNP long before his wife, who, in the, who at this, when he was appointed wasn't indeed, indeed even his wife, uh, became leader of the SNP. And I think if people have suggested that Nicola Sturgeon couldn't become leader because uh, she was married to the chief executive, I could imagine quite a lot of women in Scotland suggesting that wasn't desirable. The real difficulty, and I, come, I, I, I do agree with the earlier comments about getting a debate going, what Nicola Sturgeon didn't manage to do in the last six months of her leadership is to get that debate which Scotland now 
now faces. It is no longer simply a debate about independence. It's a debate about whether or not Scotland wants to be inside the UK, but outside the European Union, or whether it wants to be inside the EU, but therefore outside the United Kingdom. We've not really had the debate about that choice in Scotland as yet. Uh, that is now the debate that Scotland faces, and that's the debate the SNP eventually needs to be able to succeed in kicking off. Ian, very quickly, do you want to reply to that? Well, I think that my own personal view is that as an independent Scotland, I think, would apply and join EFTA uh, in the first instance, certainly for the first five years or so, until things are more established. So I don't think it's an urgent debate about whether we would join the EU. I totally accept that John's right. There will have to be a referendum after independence on whether we should apply to join or not. Well, thank you very much, all three of you, for a very lively discussion and debate. I'm afraid that's all we have time for on the show today. But remember, you can see more discussion and debate if you head on over to our YouTube channel. Go there, search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and the entire team, thank you for watching and goodbye. <laughs>